All right, we are live now. Um, so Aisha, Isha, Aisha, I don't know how to pronounce her name actually. Uh, she is currently having audio issues. So it's gonna take a few minutes before the debate actually starts, but I thought I would go ahead and start the live so I can let people know what's going on. So you're not just sitting there waiting. But yeah, we're gonna be debating on if the Nazis were socialists. How is everybody doing today? Everything coming through good, audio and everything. I'm not seeing any comments, so I don't know. How many people are in here? Six people. Nazis were not free market, but still capitalists, just like the Soviets. That's a interesting take. I think she's almost ready. I'm just waiting for a signal to know. Okay. Hey, sorry. Um, I just uh, had trouble finding my headset, so I, I was getting an echo with the sound. So I just needed a few minutes to fix the sound. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, how are you guys doing? Um, so we're going to do, I, I was planning on doing opening statements. Do you have one ready? Oh, you start first. Okay. All right, guys, I, like I, I said, on, before I that, can you give me the YouTube URL so I can tweet it out? Uh, just go on YouTube, look up Praxben and you'll find okay. it. Okay. How long is the debate going to be? I don't know. Probably within an hour. We, I usually get done within an hour. And if we're going too long, I'll just cut it short. I don't have a lot of hours to spend on this today, so we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it average debate length. Okay, done. Okay, I'm ready now. Um, so okay, now I'm ready. Um. Okay, so, so go ahead. Um, so we are, um, I am obviously a Marxist-Leninist um, and a socialist. Um, I'm a member of the CPUSA. And um, be, uh, and so I guess, start. let's start with your opening statement. Okay. Were the Nazis socialist? Yes, obviously. This isn't even an actual debate among serious people. The only reason this ever became a debate was because Marxist pseudo-historians wanted to muddy the waters of history in order to distance themselves from their close philosophical cousins, the National Socialists. Their counter-arguments are very few, but very popular amongst their followers. They usually consist of, one, completely fabricating history, two, changing the definitions of words, or three, pointing out that the National Socialists did things that other socialist regimes did. I'll give examples of all three arguments. Number one, the Nazis depended on industrialists for support. This is patently false. As historian R.J. Evans writes of the Nazi party, much of its power and dynamicism came from the fact that it was not dependent on big business for financial support. The Nazis got their money primarily from grassroots campaigns and membership dues. Historian Henry Ashby Turner notes that big businesses overwhelmingly supported the opponents of the Nazis, with very few exceptions. The few who did support them had the same belief as the communists, meaning that they thought the National Socialists weren't real socialists. They were wrong. 
several of them, such as Fritz Thyssen, ended up in concentration camps with their businesses nationalized. And let's not forget, if secretly being funded by a few rich people means you're not a socialist, then we completely can disregard the Bolsheviks as socialists as well. But that's obviously absurd. Rather than depending on capitalists for support, they depended on communists. Hitler, being a former communist himself, expressed multiple times that he wanted the Nazis to be built up off of former communists, saying, the petite bourgeois social democrats and the trade union boss will never make a national socialist, but the communist always will. And he was right. Voting data shows that areas that voted more for communists in previous elections were more likely to support the Nazis in 1933. Liberal areas were less likely to do so. And historian Timothy S. Brown notes that up to 55% of the SA were former card-carrying communists. Second argument, uh, an example of second argument is socialism is the same as Marxism. No, it isn't. This argument is self-evidently wrong and warrants no serious response. Number three, the Nazis suppressed trade unions, banned strikes, and restricted collective bargaining. Oh, really? Suppressed trade unions like Allende in Chile and Sankara in Burkina Faso? Banned and suppressed strikes like Lenin and other leaders in the USSR? Banned collective bargaining like Castro in Cuba? Wow, the Nazis must definitely not be socialists then. No, they clearly were. One of the first steps that the Nazis took in power was to repeal Articles 115 and 153 of the Weimar Constitution. What were these articles? The articles that guaranteed private property rights. As we all know, capitalism is when you abolish private property rights. No, that's absurd. Capitalism is characterized by private property rights and entrepreneurship. The great economist Ludwig von Mises noted of, entrepreneur, of entrepreneurs in National Socialist Germany, the government tells these seeming entrepreneurs what and how to produce, at what prices from, whom to buy, and what prices and to whom to sell. The government decrees at what wages laborers should work and to whom and under what terms the capitalists should entrust their funds. Market exchange is but a sham. Similarly, historian Jackson Spielvogel wrote, the government did not... Uh, the government did place restraints on foreign exchange, imports, and exports, prices, wages, and the allocation of labor. It determined the quantity and nature of what should be produced. Profits were limited and directed by the government back into reinvestment for expansion or for the acquisition of government bonds to provide more capital for rearmament. When businesses refused to work with the government on a project that would be unprofitable, the government moved in and established its own factories. Economic historian Peter Temin elaborates more on that last part, saying the Nazis viewed private property as conditional, not as a fundamental right. If the property was not being used to further Nazi goals, it could be nationalized. This happened many times, such as the Junkers airplane plant or the aforementioned Fritz Thyssen. Professor Timmon also noted the similarities between the Nazi economic planning and that of the Soviets. Both governments reorganized industry into larger units ostensibly to increase state control over economic activity. The Nazis reorganized industry into 13 administrative groups with a large number of subgroups to create a private hierarchy for state control. The state therefore could direct the firm's activities without acquiring direct ownership of enterprise. And finally, it is worth noting that Hitler had great respect for a certain prominent dictator and child rapist, that of course being Joseph Stalin. Historian Reiner Ziedelman documents, the documents this extensively in this book, Hitler's National Socialism, and in his peer-reviewed paper, The Role of Anti-Capitalism in Hitler's Worldview. Hitler especially admired Stalin's central planning model and sought to emulate it. No capitalists would ever think this. The National Socialists were not national capitalists. They were national socialists. And that's my opening statement. Okay, um, afterwards I have a lot of questions about your opening statement, so I'll make mine and then I guess we can get to um, questions. Okay, so um, let us talk about the economy of evil. Um, so let's look at what Hitler and Mussolini did when they came into power and how they came into power. So the first thing that they both did is that, um, okay, so they both came into power because Hitler in 1933 had a, had a backroom meeting with industrialists and von Papen suggested making Hitler the chancellor and he was basically handed keys to the kingdom. 
And then once he came into the pop into power, what he did was that he so back in Weimar Germany, workers had worker councils that intermediated between the um, management and the workers so that they could get wages. Hitler deregulated that. And instead, he converted all the trade unions where he put um, basically Nazi thugs in and he jailed all the union leaders. On top of that, the wages were then set in, con in accordance to what the boss was. So his law was that the bosses are the leader of the enterprise and they get to set the wages. So that is fundamentally different because in socialism, we believe in a class conflict. So we think that we believe that there is always a conflict between management and workers. And therefore, Hitler sought to um, get rid of the class conflict. And in socialism, we try to beat the, we are, we, we know it and we would never have put, let employers decide the wages. On top of that, um, he ended up privatizing over 170 different enterprises. And IG Far in the Nuremberg trials, Albert Speer said that the Third Reich was another branch of IG Farben Industries. And then when you read the Nuremberg trial transcripts, for each new acquisition, like IG Farben got concessions for their factory and they got to build the, they got to build it, finance it, and profit from it. So that's why they profited from Auschwitz, um, uh, uh, Buna Works, um, uh, and many other things. And then let's look at who put them in power. As early as 1922, there's a New York Times article that says, help for Bavaria from Americans. And Henry Ford gave $2,000 to Hitler. Um, and of course, Ben said that he, a lot of Nazis were grassroots donations. Yes, but donations from whom? So what happened was that in the Prussian kingdom, there was a class of aristocrats who would basically get rent from um, their uh, holdings and they wouldn't really do much. And some of these aristocrats didn't even get that much, just enough money to survive. So these were called the Junkers. And basically after World War I, the Junkers lost all their income because they were not getting rent and so they had to actually work. So this class of Junkers, which was a few million, ended up financing Hitler, who were basically the bourgeoisie. And on top of, and so um, that is where his Lebensraum rhetoric comes from, because he, that is what he meant, that he was going to give Junkers their previous holdings back that they lost in the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. So um, Ben is half right. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the ideas of Nazis being socialists comes from former Nazis, because they, it is to like mess up and cl clarify. The one thing I do know about USSR is that Soviet tanks were the ones that rolled into Berlin on May 9th, 1945 and defeated the Nazis. Okay, did you want to talk about <clears throat> some of the stuff I said first, or do you want me to talk about some of the stuff you said? Oh, well, I, I first have a qu qu uh, uh, first have one correction. You said Bolsheviks got their money from uh, 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 from the bourgeoisie. That is not entirely true. In 1906, there's the famous Teflis bank robbery, so they literally robbed a bank. Meanwhile, Hitler was financed by the bankers. So. Yeah, I'm not saying they got all of their funds directly. No, you said from no. You said but... you said mainly. And that's not true. Their main no. funding source was through robbing a bank in Tiflis. I didn't say mainly. I just said secretly funded. Secretly, how much were uh, secretly not? No. Well, I'm, uh... What I'm referring to is Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution by Anthony Sutton, oh, and okay. he documents then... several bankers and capitalists who gave them money. When and okay, can you give me two examples of when and how much and how, what he's talking about? Um, yeah, sure. Let me. That's about the passports. Or just one example. Um, let's see. Uh, on, I, I have, I have to sit here flipping through the book and trying to find specifically what I'm looking for. So that might take okay, a few I'll, moments. I'll find an example and you continue. Okay. Um, okay. So then the second question um, I have is, do you know when the German communist, you said um, 
a lot of the uh, SA members were former communists. When did the German Communist Party form? Are Which tra there, there were several parties that were oh, communists. No, no. Are you trying? Okay, were you talking about the KPD, the Communist Party of Deutschland? That's that's one party. It's just okay. talking about communists broadly because obviously oh, there's no, multiple no, no. parties. B because you can't really talk about broadly because you have to kind of at least be able to break down which statistics because even if a lot of parties call themselves socialists, they have different ideologies on what, what, on their strategy and things like that. So were they mainly SPD members or KPD members? I'm just curious. That's not broken down, but okay. I don't I don't think that matters if they have yeah, different... Yeah, no, no, it matters a lot because what Why? happened is that in 19... Okay. So there's again, again. So uh, so during World War One, there was a group of people called the Free Corps, who were basically bourgeoisie. And at the end of World War One, a lot of countries were destabilizing, and a lot of these bourgeoisie lands got threatened. So they hired these private militias uh, called the Free Corps. And then after the establishment of the Weimar Republic, the F a lot of the Free Corps got um, absorbed by the SPD. So if they were former members of the SPD and then they were part of the Fry Corps, it is way different than in the class character than the KPD, who were mainly workers and uh, peasants. So it's a big difference because of the differences in philosophies. But, and, and then the uh, later after the war, the SPD merged to be a more liberal party with a lot of bourgeoisie in it. So it makes a big, big difference. Yeah, I just just because you guys have disagreements within no no no, sets, not, no 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 there's a different no there's a factual difference. So for example, the uh, the Bolsheviks when they came into power, they had a decree on land, bread, and so they appropriated a lot of the bourgeoisie land. The um, SPD did not do that as a policy. What they did is when they came into power, they ended up having a, like a, a balancing act, a more like what FDR did. So there is actually a big difference in policy, not just um, you can't dismiss that because you have to look at uh, what happened in history. A so history of fascism by, by um, Stanley G. Payne, he says at least 50 to 55 percent of the members of the SA were working class. Okay, so that just that, about but matches that's up different. No, 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 but, but that communists. is different than saying they're comic members. You know, you, earlier you claimed they were members. Of, I did. Of yes, uh, these are two separate claims. There's a two separate claims. Okay, right? the working so class I'm, part I'm we, we will talk together. about later. Georgi Dimitrov addresses that. Um, but um, he, okay, so uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so then um, you, uh, he, okay, so then you also mentioned the voting data. The voting data of being in the K about how the Nazi party got a lot of the votes in the areas of the KPD. And this is why it happened because they were rural areas. So in the rural areas, there were landowners and then a lot of farm workers. So the bourgeoisie, when they felt like their land was being threatened, they voted for the Nazi party. So yes, they did, but because of the class conflict in the rural areas in Germany. Yeah, I don't think there's any evidence that the Nazis got into power because of votes from the bourgeoisie. No, 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 the Nazis didn't get into power by votes. I remember what I said in 1933. Basically, there was a meeting um, in the house of um, von uh, in in the in, in the where basically industrialized industrial. Let me just read out my passage for a minute. Um, yeah, if you're talking about the one that happened in February 1933, I've seen no historian who has claimed that the Nazis won just because of that at all. No, 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 no. They didn't win. They were ha okay. Let's. You don't have to look at historians. You can. This is in the Nuremberg trial transcript. So you just have to read the Nuremberg trial transcripts and let me explain what happened. Um, this is a, what banker Kurt von Schroeder testified in the Nuremberg trial. This is the second Nuremberg trial. Um, volume 2. Negotiations took place exclusively between Hitler and Papen. Papen went on to say that he thought it was best to form a government in which conservative and national elements that supported him were represented together with the Nazis. He suggested that this new government should, if possible, be led by Hitler and himself together. Then Hitler made a long speech in which he said that if he were elected to be cha elected chancellor, Papen's followers could participate in his Hitler's government as ministers. If they were willing to support his policy, which was planning many alterations in the existing state of affairs. He outlined all these alterations, including the removal of all social democrats, communists and Jews from leading positions in Germany and the restoration of order in public life. 
Von Papen and Hitler reached agreement in principle whereby many of the disagreements could be removed and the cooperation might be possible. It was agreed further details could be worked out later in either Berlin or some suitable place. And then um, after they worked out the, again, banker Von Schroeder um, basically um, talks about it. Um, he, uh, again, in the Nuremberg transcript, but basically, um, the, the meeting didn't yield, but in the beginning, um, a relationship that would read to his appointment on January, no, th this meeting was January 4th, 1933, and then the next meeting was held somewhere in the middle of January, and, and on January 30th, he was appointed as Reich's Chancellor because the way the Weimar Republic worked is what was through coalitions. So once Papen allowed the Nazi party to be in his coalition, they got to pick the chancellor and he was appointed. And on January 30th, 1933, he became chancellor of Germany. The Nazi party won a ton of seats in the election in March 1933. They but had that 17 was million no, but, votes. But Hitler so, was already like, chancellor in January 30th of 1933. If Hitler was by, already chancellor January 30th, then this happened a month later. So I don't know how you're arguing that he became chancellor because of something that happened a month after. No, he no, no, no. He, no. This happened on January 4th, on January 4th, 1933. Hitler, this is what Kurt Schrader's testimony is. On January 4th, 1933, which is before January 30th, Hitler von Papen, Hess, Himmler, and Kepler arrived at my house in Cologne. Hitler von Papen and I went to my study where a two-hour discussion took place. Hess, Himmler, Kepler did not take part but were in the adjoining room. The negotiations took place exclusively between Hitler and Papen. Papen went on to say he thought it was best to form a government in which the conservative and national elements um, elements that had supported him were represented together with the Nazis. He suggested that this new government should, if possible, be led by Hitler and himself together. Then Hitler made a long speech which he said that if he were to be elected chancellor, Papen's followers could participate in his Hitler's government as ministers. But I, I don't see how this is like relevant okay, at because all to what he, I said. Oh, I was no, no, talking I, about the actual votes. You're not talking no, no, about no, there the was, votes. No, the, but that is not how the Weimar Republic worked. The no, minute, regardless, have, I, no, 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 it, it matters. doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. No, it matters matter. how, 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 how no, a government is, how, no, how a president is elected is matters. So the, once they form the majority coalition. I didn't say anything about president elected. I said voted for the Nazi party. I said voted for the Nazi party. 17 million people okay, in March 17, of 1933 voted for the Nazi party. But Hitler party. was all, re okay, fine, but that's it, irrelevant. I didn't say voted for Hitler. I said voted for the party. Okay, but it doesn't matter because Hitler was already chancellor by then. Um. It, it does matter. Even, getting no, not, getting those election. 92 seats mattered a lot. And that was no, a significant amount of power. Because he had already cracked down on the, he, he already started the um, the Enabling Act and he had cracked down on all, on all of the dissidents' parties. So, yes, when there were uh, fewer parties, yes, 17 million voted. But that is, again, okay, but let's continue. Um, but you, you still have the SPD, you have the KPD, you have the Center Party. No, no, party, you don't you have, have the KPD. DMPD, no, no, Hitler DMPD. cracked down on, no, the KPD was cracked down and all of them were sent to jail and concentration camps. And The I KPD will... had almost 5 million votes. Um, let me just check. You're saying they were sent to concentration camps between January of 1933 and March of 1933? I don't think that's true. They were sent on March 23rd of 1933. The KPD was banned and sent to okay, the... Okay, after um, they lost. Uh, sent to the um, concentration camps. Right, so this is after the election. So I was right. Okay, um, Okay. so then um, you also claim... Okay, so there was a quote from Hitler you mentioned in your opening statement. When did he say that and what occasion? Uh, this is That's from a book called The True Believer by... Um, I think his name is Eric Hoffer. Uh, I would have to pull it up and get the exact please, citation please do. for it. But um, I can pull up the PDF for that in a second. Okay. Um, but um, okay. What? So so I want to go go back to some of the stuff you talked about, right? So you were okay. talking about they deregulated wages, and they made it to where the leaders in the factories were in charge of wages. No, 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 not the leaders, the employers. There's a difference. No, there. The, I know there's a difference. But you you use leaders and and employers interchangeably in your opening statement. And my mm -hmm. point is they're not interchangeable because the leaders Correct. was okay. a specific class made by the Nazis no. where they didn't act as owners. They acted no, no, as representatives on. of the state. They were Nazi party members and they acted 
to do stuff for the state. No, 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 also... I, no, no, you're getting, no, hold on, you're getting, okay, hold on one second. You're getting two things confused. So, uh, okay, so um, give me one second. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so, so um, um uh, okay, so um, on January of 1934, Nazis promulgated the Act for Organizing National Labor. And in the first act, um, the, the, the uh, act deals with the leader of the establishment and the confidential counselor. So the establishment is the owner. In each is the owner. Okay, so this is what the, the law says. In each establishment, the owner of the undertaking as the leader and the salaried and wage earner employees as his followers or vassals are directed to work together for furtherance of purposes of the establishment and for the benefit of the nation and state in general. So the yeah. owner then get to set the wages. Um, and yeah, so that's what the law says. So what you just described is that they put people in place called leaders, which are specifically- No, 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 no. They did not put the people German in place. No, front. that's wrong. It says yes, in each did. establishment, the owner, the person who's already the owner, the capitalist- No. That's in some the cases, law. they were people no, who were previously no, owners. No, this is what the law cases. says. This is, the, the, read the text of the Act for the Organization of National Labor, and this is the text of the law. Yeah, I've read the text many, okay, many please. times. Okay, please. No, no, I want you to read it again. Get get it out and read it because you You have, just read it out loud. You've then read it you are before. not, okay, no, you have to read it because you're not understanding it. So I'm, I am understanding it. I'm definitely understanding it. In each establishment, it the, the owner of, of the undertaking is the leader. So the owner was named the leader. I'm yeah, putting we, it in the context of many other texts, right? No, we have lots no, of different no, you can't put no, have, because have, this is the yeah, law. Yes, you, yes, no, yes. this is the law. The that's law not how you be... do, that's, that's not how you do historical work. You don't No, no, say, you don't know I, how to do well, historical on, work because on, you are, but, but yes, that's another story. Um, you whatever. don't do oh, historical work by reading, for example, a law and giving your own interpretation no, of it. No, 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 First, no. First, no, I'm not way, giving oh, the interpretation of my own no interpretation. Said, I was reading the interrupt. plain meaning. I was reading the plain meaning of the uh, of the text, and then once we understand the plain meaning, we have to see if it if they, how it was applied. So the first part is the no, plain you're meaning. asserting that the plain meaning agrees with you, but you're wrong. No, no, the you're plain meaning. The, the okay, well, then all read you, the text. Okay, in that case, please get the text out. Hold on, okay, please, please, get the text please, out. please. Let me finish. All okay. you have to do is look at the historical context and look at what actually happened when the law was being put into place, how they were enforcing it. That's all you have to do. And you'll see exactly what they meant. And when you look at that, you see in some cases it was people who were already owners and they were converted into leaders. That was a completely different role from owner. In some cases, they appointed new leaders because they got rid of the old owners like Fritz this and like the like the um like the junkers, right? Leader was a completely different role from owner. Leaders didn't act as owners. And in your own text that you read, it said specifically that they were to act towards the interest of the state. That's not what a private capitalist, they don't act towards the interest of the state. If you're acting towards the interest of the state and then you stop and act as a private capitalist for your own interest, then you're kicked out. That's not a private capitalist. No, no. But okay, so this is where I would disagree because Nazis um, actually believed that what was in the interest of private capital was in the state because Nazis were mostly directed by private capital. Um, as so, basically, what historical context of Nazism is that when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, it scared a lot of industrialists in Europe because they thought they were going to be next, and so they were looking for an alternative to Bolshevism. And that allowed them to keep their um, exploitation and private property and capital. And that's how all these fascist movements popped up. So fascism just didn't pop up in Germany. It popped up in Italy, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, um, one more, Poland, and Germany. And in fact, Germany was, uh, yeah, was the last Yeah, we're talking ones. about the National Socialists. So I, I know. I'm just, no, I, I mean, if National Socialists follow the doctrine of fascism. So um, not necessarily. Look, fascism well, wasn't about race. National socialism was essentially a whole religion that was very close to fascism. But fascism was something separate. Um, but OK, well, let's let's get back to the point. I consider right? it a branch of fascism. I can I, I, I don't like I think that's a, not an unfair thing, but it's it's still a like, you know, it's a debate, but it's fine. Whatever. Um, Gunter Reimann, he was a Marxist economist. He wrote this book, The Vampire Economy, under Nazi Germany. Right. So he's not anybody who he's somebody who experienced it firsthand and he's not anybody that's on my side biased towards me. He was a full on Marxist communist. He was Jewish. He had to change his last name. So he wasn't killed by the Nazis. He was in underground anti Hitler groups. Right. So he uh, recorded several examples of interviews and letters from leaders, from capitalists and entrepreneurs. And this is one of them. 
yes, I am the leader in my factory. My workers are my followers. This is the language of the, of the law, right? But I am no longer a manager. I cannot decide what is allowed or forbidden in my own factory. There have been cases where managers were removed by the party of labor trustees and replaced by commissars. So if you actually look at how the law was enforced, then it clearly was not a law saying the capitalists got more power. The capitalists already had the power to manage their own factories. This was taking away, away their power and putting it in charge of the leaders who are part of the German labor front, who are part of the state. No, no, no. The, okay, hold on. The German labor front was different because, uh, okay, fine. You're right. It's part of the state. Okay, continue. Never mind. Yeah, it was a, it was national. No, they they didn't just state. crush okay, the fine, labor fine, unions. Fine, they fine, nationalized fine, the labor go ahead, unions, go ahead. which is something that the Soviets did as well. No, the Soviets nationalized the labor unions. No, the, okay. No, no, they didn't. Okay. So what happened? Yes and no. What the Soviets did was completely, I'm glad you mentioned this. They did, it was completely different. So uh, under the Soviet Union, what happened is that um, each, um, each worker group got to have their own Soviets, which is, means it's councils. So yes, in 1920, uh, Lenin got rid of uh, different unions, but that's because, um, so the, wor the worker councils then would manage the enterprises themselves. That is very different. So workers are people who work in the factory. So the worker councils elected it in a free and fair election. And these um, worker councils manage the factory issues. Um, and then in 1920, there were um, some people who wanted to have unions. But as we know for, from what Marx says, a, a, a socialism is a dictatorship of the proletariat. So when you as a proletariat owns, controls the whole state, having unions is superfluous. So you don't need it, but it can be used by dishonest actors like people who want to do coups and, and uh, like Nazis or whatever in order to undermine the state, as we learned from Solidarno's in Poland in 1989. So that is very different. Um, so I think a lot of the misunderstandings or differences happen because you do not cons consider class. And I constantly consider the class. So yes, you talk about how Lenin got rid of rights. Yes, of course he did. But whose rights did he get rid of? He got rid of the rights of the aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, the um, the fascists. And for me, I think that is good. I support doing that um, because he, because as what Marx says is that the state is an engine to oppress one class over the other. And I want workers to be to rise, and therefore I support suppressing or oppressing aristocracies and the bourgeoisie. And so Hitler oppressed the workers while pumping up the aristocracy and bourgeoisie. And we know this because of the number of aristocracy who were Nazis, including the King of England, King Edward um, or David. Okay. So I, I don't care about the Marxist interpretation of socialism. No, no, because, no, you, 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 no, because they, no, it sounds like you're unable to argue about the Marxist interpretation because no, you No, it's because do it doesn't understand. matter. No, it matters a lot because that is my entire argument. So we can't really have a debate if you can't actually address what I'm saying because then I will have to assume that you are unable to address what I'm saying and therefore you can see the debate. So No, because socialism predates Marxism and there was no, many socialists no, but, after Marx who were not Marxist. No, there have been no it does not. Um so yes, it no it yes, does it not. Does. Uh, no, it does not. Okay, so That's why socialism. Wrote there's about the uh, no. Who came the only kind of socialist governments socialist? that have only been formed are Marxist-Leninist governments, and um, it does not predate Marxism. So um, I, uh, I, I just don't. Uh, Marx is the Marxist theory is the only one that has been able to put in practice. So because it only it represents material reality, anything that is not Marxism. So there is okay, I know you're talking about Bernstein, but Bernstein was main difference was that he wanted to do revisionism. And we saw how that failed when you go to Weimar Republic. So then there's Sismundi and Sismundi was also a little bit more like Bernstein. And so um, but ultimately, the idea uh, that actually was put into practice was Marxism Leninism. So, um, so since we are discussing reality, we have to discuss what has really happened. So yeah, this is a debate on this is a debate on if the Nazis were socialists. No, no, okay. I don't the consider Nazis anyone who's not Marxist if, to be oh, socialist. Oh, 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 so you, therefore, didn't you say that we wouldn't interrupt each other? I'm pretty sure you've oh, yeah, interrupted sorry. me multiple times. Sorry, sorry. Okay, continue. So, if if we go through all of the Marxist-Leninist presuppositions and just say all these are right. There's only been Marxist-Leninist states, which is clearly wrong, or social states, which is clearly wrong. It's not true. 
uh, then then like what's the point of debating? Because you're saying right off the bat then that, that it's complete impossibility, no matter what actual policies that the Nazis put into place, it's a complete impossibility that they were socialists. Okay. That's just a ridiculous way to go into the arguments. Very no, no, that's not what I... Oh, okay, continue, sorry. Tell me when you're done. Yeah, I mean, like, there, there were non-socialists, uh, non-Marxist socialist states. Burma, for example, Burma under the Burmese way to socialism, it was not influenced by Marxism, except for, you know, they, they took some influence in the way that Soviets structured their economy, but it wasn't, they weren't Marxist, they were just socialist. And the same thing with the National Socialists, they weren't Marxist. They had some influences that came from some of the influences of Marx, like Hegel and from Marx himself, but largely it was separating, they were separating themselves from Marxism. Okay. So, um, well, the way we have the debate is we look at the policies that each group passed and comparing them. And ultimately, the way I see the difference is because I see class. And I will look at which class is being oppressed and which class is allowed to flourish. And then I will look at the material results. So, for example, if you look at the life expectancy or if you look at um, infant mortality, with the Soviets, it went up and up. And with Nazis, it went down and down. Um, so there, so we can look at each individual policy and dissect it. But um, for you, so if you don't, so what is socialism according to you? Let's start with that. I would say socialism is an institutionalized abolition or aggression against private property. And as I pointed out in my opening statement, the very one of the very first things the Nazis did in power was to eliminate the right to private property. Uh, okay. Articles one one five and one five three. That. Um, okay. So now let's look at what the Soviet Constitution says. Um, so the 1936 Soviet Constitution um, says, um, Article 10, the right of citizens to personal ownership of their incomes from work and of their savings, of their dwelling houses and subsidiary household economy, their household furniture, utensil, and articles of personal use and convenience, as well as the right of inheritance of personal property of citizens is protected by law. So that just shows you that the Soviets are different than the Nazis. What, what does that have to do with what I just said? Well, you, okay, so you are saying that because Nazis abolished uh, the Article 153 about not taking private property without due process of law, that implies they're socialists. I am saying Soviets are socialists and they did 100% as the opposite. Therefore, this is not a feature of socialism. How, wait, wait, wait. How is, a, how, how did, is what they did? the opposite of abolishing private property. The Soviets Be did abolish private property No, they rights. didn't. No, they didn't. The you article... talked about personal property rights, not no, no, private no, no. property No, no, no. Article rights. 10. Um, no, no, no. Private property. No. Okay. The Soviets uh, abolished um, l large landed estates and uh, <laughs> that is different than private property. So do you, so landed estates came with serfs and slaves and um, so they abolished landed aristocratic property and property owned by the monastery and things like that. So that is way different. But so let's read it. Okay. The right of citizens to personal ownership of their dwelling houses and subsidiary household economy, their household furniture, utensils, articles of personal use and convenience, as well as the right of inheritance of personal property of citizens is protected by law. So it counts as your, it 100% fits your definition of prop, private property. They just used a different word and you seem to think it's a different concept. I'm just defining private property as um, privately owned means of production. Okay. Um, oh, oh, okay. So you changed the definition of property. Okay, no. fine. Um, no, that's what private property refers to. Like everybody would agree with this. I don't, you're okay, the first excellent. person okay, I've okay. ever heard In that, that case, um, that. <laughs> Okay, so in that case, um, Nazis did not abolish privately owned means of production. Yeah, what they abolished, they... The, I, I didn't say no, that. No, they they abolished... abolished the right to private property. No, 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 the no, right no, that, no. that safeguarded no, no. private property owners from the state telling them what they couldn't do. Without due process of law. The state did law. tell them that. The state, made, the state organized production. It organized who you could hire and fire. Every Every single aspect of the factory was organized by the state and the state had final say. So um, it was de facto no, no, no. socialism. No, no, because the state itself was organized by big business, IG Farben was mainly. And so it was definitely the no, end the result opposite. of capitalism. IG Farben, every no. single leading member of IG Farben were parts of the National Socialist Party, except Hold for on. one of them Let because me he, read, was, um, transcripts he was a Swiss from Nuremberg. person. Go ahead, continue. But they, they weren't directing the state. 
Yes, they, yes, they were. Let me read an example. How? how? Okay, from Nuremberg transcript. Okay, uh, letter from Farben to um, uh, uh, Reich Industry. Okay. At the conference which took place on February 5th in the Economic Department and Military Command with leaders of the IG Farben Industries, new suggestions were made by IG Farben for the transfer of both direct and indirect requirements of the armed forces to the plants belonging to Fran Color. The suggestions were based on the fact that in the big, highly mechanized German IG Farben plants where synthetic benzene or buna are produced, um, and where, for reasons important to the work economy, only German employ workers can be employed, there's a disturbing lack of specialized workers. On the other hand, IG Farben, um, uh, it is natural that a number of uh, IG Farben industries didn't examine friend color plants to see whether it would be possible to develop other products. And so then, um, let's look at what they said. Um, there's another one, um, a circular letter from the IG Farm. It is intended to, so IG Farben sends this letter, okay. It is intended that the new corporation will be registered in Berlin under the name of Ruska Beitrab GmbH, which is a corporation controlled to be controlled by Farben. This corporation will be put in charge of the various Russian plants and making decisions above all providing the funding. So basically, once the IG Farben memo went out to the Nazis, the Nazis obliged by allowing IG Farben to do this. Um, then July 1941, here's another IG Farben memo. Um, um, okay, so... Um, so then um, let's look at the, after the IG Farben requested Russian property, this is what the um, the Reich Ministry decided. The Reich, in Article 2, the Ministry does not wish any further statutory limitations for the of the purposes of the company so as to not have added obstacles by reason of its own, in the contest for the direction and control of the chem chemical plants, um, uh, chemical plants, which the right commissioners and other state administrators are quickly demand for themselves. The military is willing, however, upon request to confirm to us in writing which individual tax are being first considered. Um, okay, and then it says, on the basis of this degree, the right marshal is to promulgate the ordinance which prescribes the establishment of various limited liability companies in the view of uh, chemistry. So they, so basically, each time IG Farben sent them a memo asking for like a factory in one of the occupied territories, they kept on getting it. Um, literally, the memos became policies. So it's clear that the IG Farben was directing it. And if we look at the Nuremberg trial transcript, and especially the IG Farben trial, this is not just one example. This is like a thousand examples. And I can send you a copy of that. Um, yeah, what you're describing is Gleichschildtung. You're not describing the um, the private companies ordering the state around and what to do, right? They're they're coordinating. That's what Gleichschildtung means. That was the policy, the economic policy okay. of the Nazis. It means you're okay. coordinating, you're syn synchronizing. So they're coordinating with the state and saying, hey, for our production, we need to do this. And of course, the state was providing the necessary things for production because they had to produce things for war. They had to keep their companies, which that's what the companies were. They were fundamentally the companies of the Nazi party. They had to keep their companies actually functioning. So of course, they're not going, oh no, we're not gonna let you get a new factory if you need one. Like, of course not. Like, I don't see how this proves that that private capitalists were controlling the Nazi economy. It shows that they were coordinating with each other. And okay. that's like the entire point. They were members of the Nazi party. They're coordinating, <laughs> coordinating with the state, with the heads of the Nazi party and saying, hey, we need this, please provide it. And then they had it done. But there was also numerous examples of the state ordering IG Farben around. Um, Peter Temin talks about this a bit in, in his paper that I, I, I referenced okay. earlier. So can you please give me an example? Sure. The leadership of the firm, IG Farben, was drawn into the Nazi net by use of selective terror. Very rapidly in <laughs> April 1933, the Nazis intervened in, Farbe, in, in Farben's activities. Hayes, he's talking about um, Hayes, who wrote Industry and Ideology, which is a prominent book on IG Farben. Uh, Farben sorry. Um, Hayes concludes that in the first 18th month, 18 months of Nazi rule, established that in the Third Reich, for the individual businessman and everyone else, terror was the greatest of political realities. And they give a specific example um, for a member of IG Farben in 1939, and he started to criticize Hitler at a private event. And they responded by, let's see, the, the Farben executive was denounced to the Gestapo and threatened with a trial and a possible prison sentence for making untrue or grossly distorted statements about the party's leaders. So they use terror directly against 
leaders in IG Farben to when they even remotely criticize the party. So there's, I, I, again, like nothing you cited is actual evidence that they were ordering the state around and there is evidence that they weren't. So I don't see how that makes any sense to come to that conclusion. Uh, okay. Um, uh, to me, a coordinating is enough because I see class. So for me, the fact that they were coordinating means that the state was representing the interests of the, IG, the bourgeoisie class. Um, that, that is what I interpret it. So I no, understand that your the, worldview... All of, this, all of the factories, that all of the companies... Hold on. Like literally, if they did not go with the the will of the state, they were nationalized. They got rid of those. Okay, leaders. they should have got. Okay, and I would say, in uh, as opposed to collaborating with Hillary, you should get nationalized. That's the ethical thing to do. But that's another story. Um, but they didn't get really nationalized. They would get distributed to one of the uh, collaborating companies. Um, that's an, but, um, I like I said. To me, I think the main difference in the way we see things comes from the fact that I always see class. And libertarianism is an ideology based on class blindness. So as long as we do that, we'll look at the same set of facts and interpret it differently. So, for example, while you see superficial um, similarities between the Bolsheviks and whoever else, I will always look at which class are they benefiting, which class are they harming, and then I will interpret the events based on that. So class is how people earn their living. So if you work as a way for wage, if you give labor for in exchange for wages, you're a proletarian. If you are a rent seeker or get profits or dividends, then you are a bourgeoisie. And then there's the third class, which is a hereditary um, aristocracy. So that is where most of our disagreements come from. So. Um, so and this is the pattern over and over so yes you say that they were coordinating to me that is enough evidence to, and that and combined with the fact that ig farben made billions and billions and billions in their profit i could see that the nazi party is working for their benefit or benefiting them and so that to me is evidence enough that the nazi is the nazis are basically working for the benefit of ig farben yeah, so the problem with looking at things purely through a class lens is obviously we all have different opinions on that. The Nazis saw race instead of class, and libertarians see class as between citizens and the state rather than uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So there's different views on class, but that's why I'm trying to look at actual policies and what they actually did. Like, we, no, no, you can say, oh, well, well, well here's, I, I'll finish making my point. You can say, oh, well, this wasn't benefiting the workers enough. But now your argument is it can't be real socialism unless it actually works how I want it to work. And I think that's just silly. Like, there's numerous examples of socialists implementing poor policies that destroyed real wages, for example. That's what happened under Salvador Allende. Real wages plummeted under Salvador Allende because his policy sucked. Right. That happens with Marxist socialists quite often. So just saying like, oh, well, you have to you have to actually implement your policies successfully in order for it to be real socialism. Then that's I, th I think that's a little silly. That's 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 having way too much of a narrow definition. But even then, even then, if we're just going on, who were they favoring? Was it the workers or was it the, the managers? Then it was the workers, definitely, 100%. In fact, yeah. I'll give a specific example. So this is from historian Richard, Richard Tador, who wrote, um, I think it's Hitler's Revolution, right? Let me see. Hitler's Revolution, yeah. He's, he wrote, for the court proceedings for 1939, it demonstrates that the labor law primarily safeguarded the well-being of employees rather than their overseers. During that year, the courts conducted 14 hearings against workers and 153 against plant managers, assistant managers, and supervisors. In seven cases, the directors lost their jobs. So if you actually look at the labor laws and who they were targeting with the labor laws and who they were protecting with the labor laws, then it was overwhelmingly the workers. Okay, so let's look at wages. Um, so nominal wages per hour um, in 1931 was 116 um, uh, uh, Reichsmark. 1932, um, it was 97. 1933, it went down, 94.6. 1934, 97. 1935, 98. 1936, 100. So it never came back up to the, uh, uh, the 1935 uh, five level. So, and then Hitler cut social provisions and he privatized that. 
Um, he repeated, which um, included food rations to the poor under the guy. And in 1934, the homeless were rounded up en masse and sent to concentration camps as a way of getting rid of public nuisances. Lenin, on the other hand, actually nationalized a monastery and forced them to take in homeless children. Um, so so, that, so that, that's the one thing. So th that's why I can see that they did not benefit the workers. Um, but ultimately, I, okay, for me, socialism is the definition given by Marx is the formation of a dictatorship of the proletariat. So um, I, so ultimately, it's not about whether they're successful or not. It's about, well, well it, it's, not, it's, it's about w what the policies actually did. It's not about success, but it's about looking at the results and the effect and taking the data and looking at the effect they had on life expectancy, taking the data and looking at the effect that they had on infant mortality, taking the data and look at, looking at the have effect it had on malnourishment, looking at the GDP, looking at the GDP per capita, looking at the Gini index. So I look at each policy and check the effect it has on the population and then I make that conclusion. So um, we both go about it in completely different ways. Um, and I understand what libertarians kind of see the government as an all, but I, I would have to say that there are different kinds of government that work for, that, that have different levels of participation with people. To, and I don't know how much you can separate people from the government, but that's another story. But if we are arguing, if they're socialist, um, you, you have a, your definition of socialist that does not conform with most people who actually call themselves socialist, which is like Marxism, Leninism. So then um, it, it, it kind of, it seems like because our worldviews are so different, we look at the same set of facts and we'll interpret it in our own ways. So I think ultimately that is where most of the disagreements come from is that we look at the worldview and the way we interpret our facts is completely different. Yeah, I mean, I already said I'm looking at the actual policies rather than the effects of the policies, but still, I we can look at the effects of policies, and I just gave one example that proves that um, those specific labor laws that you mentioned, even in your opening statement, overwhelmingly benefited the workers no, how, over yeah, the managers. Okay, I look at, I, I just so, showed you they do not but, benefit the workers because wages no, no, but, but I, I get Like in that specific example, right? If you want to talk about all of the other things that you mentioned, then those are different things. But in that specific example in the actual courts, they were overwhelmingly going okay. after this managers like for mistreating you workers. Are, okay, so okay, so what I, I guess my method is different because I look at all of these things cumulatively and then make my conclusion. So I, I feel like you are nitpicking, like you are quote mining and not looking at every single aspect of the Nazi labor law. And one great book I would recommend is Salvador Gaetano. It's called Under the Acts of Fascism. Um, he, he talks about Mussolini's Italy, but then he also talks a little bit about H Hitler. And it's actually a very good book to kind of understand the complete effect it had on workers. All right. So let's let's look at those effects on workers then. OK, right? this is from uh, Richard Titor's book on the biography of Adolf Hitler. OK, talking about the labor laws, even the poorest persons are better, better clothed than was formerly the case. Working conditions were improved with more windows, less crowding, and better washrooms. Under the slogan, beautification in every place, all offices and workrooms were kept clean and neat. They were abundant flowers so that those who labored could also enjoy their surroundings. Never before had the worker enjoyed such privileges. Robert Lay's Labor Fund provided subsidized concerts, theater performances, exhibitions, dances, films, and adult education courses for the workers. The most revolutionary project was subsidized tourism. The humblest, the humblest laborer and his family could now travel abroad luxury liners for undreamed of holidays. The worker sees that we are serious about raising his social, his social position. That's a, a quote from Robert Lay. And he, he goes on with several other examples. Oh, and we okay. can go back to like w wages, for example. Hold on. Um, you uh, brought up on, nominal wages. I, I have a different interpretation of the same thing. Um, this is from William, William A. Robson, Labor Under Nazi Rule. Um, he says, um, okay, before 1933, Germany was one of the most progressive countries in the world so far as the position of the organized labor was concerned. The German working class movement started to emerge. Uh, okay, hold on. Um, um, okay, let's start with, um, 
Okay, Li liquidation of the working class. The subject of industrial relations engaged attention of Nazi government shortly after accession to power. Hitler became chancellor in January of 1933. On May 2nd, the Nazis seized all trade union buildings, arrested all union leaders, and confiscated trade union property. In the following months, the Social Democratic Party was suppressed and a few remaining leaders taken into custody. In July, the formation of all new par parties were forbidden. From that moment, the German labor movement was liquidated. It has been truly said that the Germany no longer has any working class organization. It is accepted in the meaning of the term. On January 1934, Nazis prim okay, um, promulgated the Act for the Organization of Labor, um, which the leading principles of new dispensation are to be found. This statute repealed 11 acts and orders containing the almost the whole mass of labor law which has been passed since 1918. Um, and... Um, uh, okay, okay. Um, and, and proprietor of the business is trans transformed into the act, into its furor, but the change is merely verbal. Um, uh, okay, okay. So then it says, um, the size of the uh, confidential councils varies from two to ten persons. A confidential man must not be less than 25 years old. He must have worked in the undertaking for at least a year and have engaged in the same occupation for two years. He must be possession of civic rights and belong to the German labor front. In other words, he must be a complete Nazi. So, in fact, before the unions would have to, so with unions, you need basically people who are willing to do collective action in order to basically stop work and then fight for rights. When you kill all the union leaders and replace it with Nazis who won't fight, you essentially defang unions. So when you defang unions, there's more. Um, let's continue with the conditions. Um, uh, he also had a labor trustees, um, social honor courts. So hold on. Okay, abolishment of unemployment. But basically, they say they abolished unemployment, but the law. Um, uh, what they did was they had these labor councils where people were like not really paid. Um, the Labor Service Act was passed in Germany, was made a promulgate feature. But the Labor Service Act basically gave state money and allowed private companies to hire people for very low pay. Um, so, like I said, again, um, and then there was the industrial conscription. On June 19, a decree empowered the government to require anyone to perform work for the urgent of national importance. But then this ended up benefiting industry. So, um, okay, so one thing I would like to change is I wouldn't say Nazis were capitalists, but Nazis were the first neoliberals where they would use the state to benefit some, some uh, form of industry. Um, so I, I think that's what I would uh, clarify. Okay, we can we can talk about again some of the specific data points that you brought up. So if you you said nominal wages, I don't know why we're not looking at real wages. Okay, let's look at real wages. Um, real wages went down too. Um, when? Okay. Um, basically, um, let's see. In 1932. Okay. Okay. Um, you're right. Real wages did not go down. Okay, you're right. Um, okay, that's fine. Um. But then um, what, what did go down is that um, there, uh, uh, okay, so then um, let's see. Um, uh, oh, the labor conscription would mean that basically if an industry wanted it, like you didn't have any freedom. You could just like to quit or whatever. You could just like go and you had to be, go uh, where, wherever. So ultimately um, the difference is that the, uh, the difference is that who is empowered and who is not and Ultimately, with the, the vacation thingies, um, this author, William Robson, said that they were basically like a distraction away, like a, like a little bit of an opium to the masses. So, um, and then, of course, if we look at what happened in the Eastern Territories, there was millions of people like who were working in Auschwitz and then they got all murdered. So, um, obviously, if you consider uh, what happened in the Occupied Territories, there's no way any reasonable person said, could say that workers were better off under the Nazis because millions of workers who were conscripted to work in the Buna Works factories in all the other factories were literally slaves who had a de death, person, death rate of 10% a day. So, um, but I, I guess the, uh, for me, um, ultimately, that, that's the thing is that the futility of, I, I guess it's not futile, but it's just that because our perspective is the same data point, we'll both interpret it differently. It's like not like we're able to convince each other. Um, but 
So it's not um, it's not even that it's not like the same data points it's usually i have problems with a lot of the data points brought up like bringing up nominal wages instead of real wages and then also looking at the cost of living and all of the additional welfare benefits that they gave to people which were a they lot they did not give welfare benefits they privatized they definitely the did. welfare no no, no uh, they... check out hitler's beneficiaries by god sal it's an entire book okay. about the welfare state of the um of nazi germany it was very heavy they they implemented a lot of taxes on the bourgeoisie in order to fund the welfare state um okay so but, uh, uh, I, I, and i would i wouldn't like fundamentally argue that the workers were better off like overall like obviously this wasn't was a, okay, something I, I, that was what, what sustainable that there was a section of workers inside the uh main 19 the versailles treaty german territory that were better off and so that, that were benefiting um i will uh, can, uh, so yes inside the if you look at the 19th Versailles Treaty of the way Germany was drawn inside that there were a section of workers that were better off. But that was there was a very good reason for that, because you need soldiers to go fight your war of conquest. So so I would have to say in that case, yes, but that doesn't mean the overall working class was better off, as we've seen um, with the millions of dead. Yeah, I'm, the, I, I'm saying like. In, in some relative terms, you see improvements for the working class, but that's disregarding, for example, the the millions of Jews who were, which, I mean, I guess it wasn't millions of German Jews per se. There was a lot of German Jews, obviously. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I know most of the Jews were like from, from other countries. Um, but regardless, you know, there were still millions of people who were oppressed in various ways, but I'm looking specifically at those economic policies because like it was, it, it wasn't, socialism for everyone obviously it wasn't socialism for the jews first of all it was socialism for the aryans so i'm looking specifically at who the aryans are or who the nazis are and whether those workers are the ones benefiting because that's kind of the point um okay. i'm not saying that they were trying to do socialism for everyone they were trying to say oh we want the jews to, the jewish workers to have greater control over their workplace and stuff like that obviously that wasn't the case but okay um, i'm looking what? at socialism within the context of who it was actually supposed to be, right? We don't look at Soviet socialism in the context of if it benefited people living in Florida. Like, obviously, that's that's not the point. The, the point is to benefit the people living in the Soviet Union. And with the Germans, it was broken down even more. It wasn't just the people within the nation. It was the people in their, what they perceived as their nation, which was the Aryan people. Okay, Um. so I have a question. Would you be up for, this was actually a good discussion. It was much more better than I expected. It's just, it's 11 o'clock here. Um, would you be willing to continue this next week? Uh, possibly. I, I I won't commit, but possibly. Okay. It, if we can possible. decide Let's, on something that we can actually talk about. Oh, well, no, we can talk about this. We can continue the, this discussion, but um, yeah, let's continue. Um, How about this? We talk on Twitter and schedule a follow-up where we can kind of narrow down the topics so that we're not all over the place. Would you like to do that? Sure. Okay, cool. In that case- if I, okay. Unless I don't have time, but you know, we'll, we'll, we can try. Well, okay, either next week or the following week. Um, so with that, I'm really, really uh, tired because it's 11 o'clock and I have to go out of town tomorrow. So um, I hope uh, you had some fruitful, uh, you, you found it mildly fruitful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was good. Okay, cool. See you guys next sometime. You can do a quick closing statement if you want before um, you go. Well, check out my uh, blog historically.net and I do write a little bit more about the Nazi economy and I will continue to do so. And hopefully we'll see where our perspectives differ and how, how we see the world so that we can see the world through each other's eyes eventually. Yeah, I put your article, Economy of Evil, in the chat and I'll also put my own Substack article so people oh, can oh. check out both of them. And Excellent they can see idea. like the sources and stuff like that. Yep. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye. That's just privatization. I'll put my other one. I did a two parter. Unlike her, she just did a one.